Well, the one thing I can say in taking nothing away from W. Thompson or from Donald Ross, this is a Stanley Thompson masterpiece. I always say he was as much an artist as he was an architect. And you go to some holes and you look at where a bunker might have been placed or shaped. And if you imagine it differently or you cover it up, it gets out of balance like in a painting. So he really took the time as an artist as well as an architect to put together each hole so you could enjoy it as much for how you play it and how it flowed to how it aesthetically looked for you. Welcome to the province of Alberta, the home of the fourth season of Canadian Classics. This season, we'll be traveling to six courses in seven days, traveling thousands of kilometers across the province. Our goal is to uncover some hidden gems, check out some munis, take a look at some great golf holes, seek out those value golf options, and admire the courses nestled within the Rockies. Today, we stop in a Banff National Park, one of the most popular tourist destinations in Western Canada. Also home to one of Stanley Thompson's most renowned masterpieces. Fellow friend and golf course architect, Christine Frazier, joins us to discuss the challenges of creating a layout that does the epic scenery justice. Director of Golf, Steve Young, and Parks Canada representative, Kim Fisher, discuss what it's like to operate a golf course inside a national park. Welcome to this episode of My Beauty at Fairmont Banff Springs. Oh shit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Like the Canadian flag right in front yeah. of it. Yeah, so this is Bear Street, I believe. Unless that's Bear Street. I mean, but the what main is street is right. The main street is. The main street is. <laughs> this tour guide sucks. <laughs> People don't know that this was a Donald Ross golf course at one point. Well, it even goes earlier than that. Yeah. So W. Thompson came here in 1911 and he opened the first golf course. He actually was a disciple under old Tom Morris over in uh, in Scotland at the old course. So he came over to Winnipeg. He was brought here by CP, Canadian Pacific Railway, to build a nine-hole golf course. And it went from, uh, not from the hotel, but down the road where our current uh, 12th hole or, or our maintenance compound is, up to the clubhouse and back. And then they brought Donald Ross in to expand it to 18 holes. And he completed that in 1923. But of interest was that CN, so Canadian National, the rival railroad, had hired Stanley Thompson to come out to Jasper and to build a golf course. And it was getting rave reviews. And of course, Stanley Thompson, during the interwar period when that was happening, was seen as one of the top three golf course architects. So CP invited Stanley Thompson to come up here. And the quote is, they asked him to build the last word in golf. So he came and took the ground that was already used, added some areas. Uh, the Devil's Cauldron was one of those, the tee shot from the top of the world, the number 15, the old number one was one of those. And he created a golf course that in 1939, when they did the first unofficial ranking of golf courses, it was ranked number eight in the world. And of interest, number 10 at that time was Augusta National. What makes this place so beautiful? There's really so many different things. I mean, first of all, is the iconic place that it rests. So you're always in the shadows of these large monstrosity of mountains. And then it's just all the different weather and wildlife that you can encounter during your round. The golf course is located on the Rundle Wildlife Corridor. So we have lots of animals that travel through the space year round, including cougars, wolves, black bears and grizzly bears, as well as elk. It's a really important place and there's a lot of people that also use this space too for golfing. So often in the spring you'll see elk and even grizzly bears and black bears come down to the valley bottom and they're munching on all the green grass uh, that is here, the golf course. It's a great spot for them to get that initial feed um, and help them get strong for the summer and the fall. Um, and then through the summer we see bears and wolves on the periphery of the, uh, the golf course. Into the fall, it's an important spot for elk. It's the rut, so they're mating. So you can see some pretty impressive um, elk battles on the golf course. And then into the fall, um, and then into the winter, bears go into hibernation. So it's wolves, elk, and uh, cougars that are traveling down at the valley bottom here. So he's an artist, and I love that point. He's also a visionary to a certain extent. So I, I'm hoping you can share a little bit about him walking the grounds before he started work, and he saw an opportunity from 
what I understand with a parcel of land between the hotel and... When he was given the chance to come and do this design, he went out and Donald Ross's design all fit within the road that you have here today. When he came, he said, I need to connect the golf course to the hotel. And that's where he built holes 13, 14, and 15, and 16 for his designs in order to make sure that it connected to the hotel. There was a campground right there, the Tunnel Mountain Campground. He got that moved up to the top of Tunnel Mountain so that he could have that land to build those holes. He also, holes number three, four, and five, which are spectacular, he envisioned and saw number four, the Devil's Cauldron, and he needed to get there and then get back. So he created three that as you go around the corner, you all of a sudden see this massive slab of a mountain behind you, and it looks like Gibraltar, and that's why the name is called Gibraltar hole number three. really can't argue when uh, hole number four is one of the top par threes in the world. That's a recognition it got in the early 2000s. So you just hit your tee shot on the cauldron. Yes. What's, what's on your mind? I, uh, we're four holes in and I'm completely overwhelmed with what I'm seeing. And I think there's so much to say about how it's easy in golf architecture to compete with the landscape. The golf is really directing your eye toward the visual with the bunkers and the layout. And then the landscape is also encapsulating you to, to come back to the ground. Yeah, it's, uh, I didn't realize how small that target was too. On this hole, it's absolutely tiny and it makes you feel completely insignificant and also very powerful at the same time. Yeah, you constantly are going back and forth between head up, head down, head up, head down. Absolutely. It would have been so tempting for an architect to want to make the golf pop and be the focus of this experience. And what it does is the opposite. And this is a great example of that at the cauldron. So we just played two par threes in the first four holes, which is quite unusual. But I think that's a testament to allowing the landscape to dictate good golf and not forcing you know, traditional golf numbers and routings onto the land. And in this case, because the land is so you know, stringent and difficult to maneuver, it's rocky, it's, it's mountainous, then you know, two par threes in the first four holes is, is, you know, is perfect. I also love number nine, a par five, that when you get there and you look at the yardage, you go, huh, and you hit it off the tee and you're holding an iron on your second shot going, huh. Then you get up near the green and four shots later with a bogey, you're like, oh, because his green sights and the way it slopes down and the way he's put some bunkering around the green to make it harder to get to, he really challenges you with the risk reward style. Number of his bunkering in the fairway, he says, look, if you hit it really well, you can clear this bunker and you'll have an easier shot in the green. If you're not sure about that, take the longer route and it becomes a little bit harder hole. So you're always challenged out there with risk reward. Yes. Oh, look at the speed. <laughs> we can go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> that is so sick. That's so good. Damn, that's so I look to hole five and hole 12 of par fours as being as a pure golf hole from the tee shot to the shot to the green to the chip or the bunker shot in the putts as being amazing golf holes because you can never go to sleep till that ball's in the hole. Oops. 
That's what this hole's all about, eh? It's deceiving. I mean, even from the tee, it has this incredible layering where there's just sand in your face. But you get up here and there's a 30 yard wide fairway. There's lots of options. You can hit it left or right. And then you get to this green, which looks so appealing. You want to just attack it because it's wide up front. And then there's a sneaky pin in the back. We kind of have it today. Yeah, we do, where it just like narrows in. Like you miss there by, I don't know, you're only like 20 feet left of the pin. And I, you're, you're probably yeah. in jail right now. I, I think I'm a little bit in jail. And then look at this, this is like so surprising. This is what's been happening all day here is like, you, you're looking down, you turn a corner, and then you have this. <laughs> like, it's incredible. It's nonstop views. It just, it makes me feel really happy. Yeah, I mean, this hole is interesting because of the backdrop. It's so easy to get distracted with what's happening around you. And if you miss for a second, like this is not a straightforward hole. Like this movement, this contouring. If you're in that bunker, you have no idea where the hole is. You can't see the green. And it again has this really like pinch point at the back, which I'm so interested in. Yeah, it's nice that it's back to back. It's like 12 sort of warms you up for 13 yeah, degree. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, like, don't forget you're playing golf because this is not as easy as it seems. Let's talk a little bit about the bunkering at Vance Springs. Yeah, so Stanley Thompson, as I say, he's known for a lot of his par threes. He's also known for his bunkering and we get a lot of superintendents and we get architects to come out here to look at his bunkering. One thing we focused on over the last number of years and will continue to is making sure that we restore them. I look at it like the Mona Lisa, you know, we want to make sure we put the features back. We want to make sure we, we, we keep it whole to what it was. So we've got old photos of what the bunkers used to look like and we're always making sure as we do our renovations, we're making that fit to what it was. He would look up in the mountains and he would shape it based on that. He also didn't always do it with one big bunker. He may have made five or six bunkers into a complex to create the largeness that he wanted rather than just having a whole bunch of sand. We also have a snake bunker on number, on number 14. So he was known to play around with a few different designs out there and you can often find those. He's not around to ask them, but um, obviously there, there are little nuances that he's left. But he used bunkering in his artistry in order to create his holes. He faced large obstacles in terms of having to get parcels of lands he wanted. He also struggled with having enough money and yet every time he was able to convince them of his vision, he was able to bring them out here and explain what he wanted to do, how he would build the last word in golf, show the land sites, get them to buy into what he was gonna create here. And so when you say visionary, you're 100% right. He was able to get people to buy into what this could be. So what we are today and all this grandness is because of his ability, not just as an artist and an architect, but his ability as a visionary to get that across to his investors and to his stakeholders to believe in him enough to allow him to complete this. Playing Banff Springs and retracing the hallowed footsteps of Stanley Thompson is nothing short of awe-inspiring. As someone who has always believed that Canada is the most breathtaking country in the world, this experience is unveiling an entirely new dimension of beauty 